and the 101st Airborne were in eastern Afghanistan and they were taking heavy casualties. All the regiments were taking heavy casualties and a lot of those attacks were organised and planned from inside Polish Shafi by a gentleman called Talib Jan and he ran the suicide bombing network for the Akani network and Taliban in Halmand. How are you, mate? I am good, mate. I am very good. And I'll send you off out the world. Yes. I'm never going to complain anyway, so... <laughs> it's all good. Well, you get one life. If you want to spend it depressed, it, I've done all that shit, mate, you know, and I'm, I'm yeah. not doing it again. Oh, hell, hey, you've got, you've got one life. You live it to, to the full, mate. That's what it's about. Yeah, exactly. So first question, is it true the Royal Marines are better than the Paras? Um, all I'm going to say on that one is the new advertisement poster, um, ready for anything, is outstanding. Um, <laughs> at the end of the day, if you can have a bit of banter with fellow servicemen, then there's something wrong. At the end of the day, the Marines do like the Paras, the Paras do like and re re respect the Marines mate as well. So at the end of the day, we, we all do the get, we all get the job done. I think we're entering a bit of a nicer world now, mate, because um, all the paras I speak to, it's, it's just like talking to a brother, you know, that it's just that simple. We all get on. There's a lot of us doing this sort of thing on and social media and um, yeah. I think it I think all that um animosity stuff goes back to an era that's gone by now, doesn't it? I think it does, mate. It's actually really good to to see now that serving serving members of the forces and veterans are now working together to uh, to keep everything positive and to support each other, mate, as well. Yeah. Well, the enemy is mental health at the minute, isn't it? You know, keeping yeah. on top of our mental health. And uh, I think a lot of us that join up come from a background where we're predisposed to to battle our mental health in later life. And uh, yeah. we've got to stick together and um, support each other. But uh, how did you end up joining the Paras? Um, joined the Parachute Regiment. I joined the TA at first when I was 17. Um, I was a bit, a bit young, shouldn't have really been allowed in, but my family um, persuaded the CEO to give me a chance. Um, joined Four Power, um, 17, spent a few years in Four Power, then decided to join the regulars, went back down to Depot Power, done um, the full P Company again. Um, and then went to three power. Is there any, um, I don't know what, what to say, let's just call it bad feeling there. If you've been, if you've been a reserve or, or TA and then you join the regulars, is that, is that ever an issue? No, nah, I, I, mean? nah, I, um, I don't think there is because a lot of the TA um, are former regulars as well. So they've, they've already spent a lot of time in. But what I did was when I went back down to Depot Power, I never told them that I was former Four Power. Um, so I went through the entire training process again because I, I, I just wanted to gain the respect from 
the the elder guys because when I joined uh, on a past peak company in 1988, all my depot staff had been in the forefront. So I wanted to earn the re re respect of the elder guys. So I went back down to the depot again, didn't tell anyone that I was uh, ex four power and had me wings. Um, and I, so I did it all again, three quarters away through training. My sergeant came up to see me, Sergeant Witten, Tam, who's actually a friend now. And he said, uh, you're the ultimate gray man. We couldn't figure you out. And it turns out you've already done more parachute jumps than after dead boss stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. The only reason I mention it is I, I it, to be honest, it's since doing the podcast, I meet, I meet a lot of Marines that were in the RMR, so the Royal Marines Reserve, right? And they got their green lids that way. And they always like come to me with a bit of an apology and like, oh, I was only RMR. And I'm like, what the fuck you on about? You got, if you've got a green berry, you've got a green berry. You know, that's, you, 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 you're part of the brotherhood, so to speak. Um, yeah. I, I just feel a bit sorry for them feeling like they're, they're down here when it's not, it yeah. was never like that in the, I mean, I, I got like halfway through our tour of Belfast before re realizing two of the guys I served with every single day, every it's 24 seven on tour, right? Yeah. Before re before realizing that they come through the RMR and you, you don't know any freaking difference, you know? Yeah. I think, um, yeah, you're always going to get somebody who reckons some element is better than the other element. You're always going to get that. As far as I'm personally concerned, you TA, you regular, you you put on the uniform in the Marines of the Powers, TA units. As far as I'm concerned, you class as exactly the same. I think Afghanistan and Iraq has really highlighted that because a lot of TA from the Royal Marine units and the Parachute Regiment and all the other units in the Army, a lot of TA ended up doing operational tours out there. So I think that was a bit of a game ch changer. Yeah, you sign up to be a weekend warrior and the next thing you're on the front line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you couldn't make that up, mate. If someone told me that was going to be the case back in 1988, I would have said, what? But, you know, I think the TA is a very important, uh, well, I don't think I know, the TA is a very important part of supporting the regulars. Oh, every service person plays just as just as an important role as anyone else, doesn't matter who you are. The, yeah. the the service relies on on every every individual. Otherwise, you wouldn't you wouldn't be there, would you? Yeah. You know, if you need to stack a blanket, you, someone needs to stack the blanket. If you need to strap a, you know, a first field dressing on someone, that then that needs to be done. If you need to be at the leading edge of the SAS or the SBS, that's also a a, a you know a, a a role. Um. So. Are you like me then, Anth? Have you done two balloon jumps? Yeah, well, um, yeah, we did two, two balloon jumps, but back in the early 90s, the TA was able to get a lot more parachute jumps in than what the regulars. And on one occasion, we were in four power. We were jumping at... Red car in the northeast of England, a kind of a PR for the parachute regiment. And I managed to do six jumps out, out of a balloon in an afternoon, which was incredible. Um, it's just a shame they've stopped it all now. I tell you what, it should be part of the syllabus for all young people these days yeah. to do that balloon jump. You know, get off the Xbox, get up in that balloon jump out and you'll have something for the rest of your life to be very proud about because it it was it was an amazing experience wasn't it yeah oh hell hey i, I ain't gonna i ain't gonna lie when you when when you're up there still on the end of the uh, 
of the balloon cage and you're looking over the uh, the edge, you're thinking, what the hell? But as soon as you make the move and you jump out, it's it's awesome. It's one of those feelings that it's just you you cannot you cannot beat it for want of a better word. Yeah. I mean, because I I've chatted to people on the podcast and they've had way more operational experience. I mean, I ever only ever went on one um, active service operation, which was Belfast, as I'm sure everyone's probably fed up with me talking about now. But I've spoken to paras that have got like massively way more operational experience than I had. But. They didn't do the balloon jump. They jump out. This is—is is it like a Cessna caravan or something, or a sky van or something? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, oh, you missed a, you know, you missed a part of British parachuting military history there. Yeah, it is. We're of the actual age where they don't do that, and a lot of people be fair to it. And it's just a shame because it was actually being a little part of history there. Oh, oh, one sec, mate. Oh, hang on. Sorry about that, mate. We for friends and we had a technical issue, and I got really big all of a sudden, which is quite hilarious if you know the jokes that I that I have with my son. <laughs> I'll tell him I'm the biggest daddy in the world, and <laughs> he doesn't he doesn't <laughs> agree with me. <laughs> um, uh... oh, yeah. We were talking about the sky van, weren't we? And um, how parachuting's changed. Aye, it has. Uh, yeah, it's um, definitely. Uh, well, it's come on a long way, hasn't it? I didn't do an awful lot. I've done the, the only parachute I actually did was with a static line. Um, obviously in the power wedge, but uh, quite a lot of the boys went on to do a lot of it. it, it Advanced uh, are we showing that? Yeah. The um I did a bit of skydiving, not a lot, but enough to get the the ticket that they give you, the a AFF, I think it's called. Mm. Um it's a mad sport. It's just a mad sport. I mean, yeah, so I'm I'm not making much sense. <laughs> I well, realize that. We were um me, myself and another person are looking at doing a tandem skydive in the shadow of Mount Everest at the end of the year as well. Wow. So I think, it, yeah, that's going to be an interesting on that one. How does that work out then? Where Do you have to go to Nepal or something? Yeah, it's a nine-day tr trip. So you've got to go over and get climatised and that. But uh, that that I will let you know how that, that is, because yeah. uh, if you're going to do it, you've got to do it properly, haven't you? Yes. It was. Um, I think it was a point when I did my skydive training, and I turned to my instructor and said, "Can I just do a somersault out the aeroplane?" And and he said to me, "You're trained now, Chris. You do what the fuck you want." <laughs> and I was like, "Yes." And that was a uh, that just brought it home to me the just the madness of that sport being able to throw yourself out of an aeroplane at fifteen thousand feet, yeah. and just basically fuck around for a minute and then pull your parachute. It's it's just indescribable, you know. <laughs> I mean, the balloon jump is one thing; jumping yeah. from a herc is another, and they're, they're both amazing experiences, but. They're quite controlled, you know, it's a series yeah. of one, two, three, you know, you don't pull your ripcord, obviously, but it's it's kind of to dispatch you onto the ground, isn't it? Yeah. Whereas skydiving is, it's almost like the opposite. It's about the time <laughs> in the air. <laughs> yeah. So, um, did you enjoy your time in a Paris? Yeah, I did. Um, it was an education. The, the reason why I joined the military, it was more like a family tradition. I'm a fifth generation. So my granddad, my dad, my uncles, I've all been in the military. Um, yeah, so I thought, yeah, I'm in there. 
got the got the ex- experience of it. Um, I didn't actually do an awful lot in the hours. I, I was a bit like a bit like yourself. We only did one short operational tour in Northern Ireland uh, back in the day. But I was I was fortunate enough to be able to travel the world on sunshine tours, um, Kenya, Cyprus, all those sort of nice places. So. Um, yeah, so it, it was it, it was good. It, it taught me a lot. It gave us confidence, and it gave me, unbeknown to me, it gave me the very basic skills I would need for a career that was not even on the horizon at that point. Um, so all my most of my operational and combat experience never actually came from being with the British military. A lot of people are quite surprised at that. Nearly all my combat experience came from being with the Americans. So um, yeah, so it's been an interesting time. Is that a, we'll obviously come on to that? But is, are we talking the CIA connection now? Uh, yeah, well, the CIA connection, but I also went in as a embedded combat photographer with a hundred first airborne. So I was able to see a lot from within. Um, the American side of things, how they operate. Um, Funny thing was, I I had to become an embedded photographer because a lot of people were asking questions of why I was there. I was obviously there to to help the intelligence services. So then 101st had to go out and get me a camera. (laughs) So I thought that was quite funny. But um, yeah, so... Um. Let's just chat about Kenya because I'm very passionate about well life. I love traveling. Um, it's kind of like a very weird, funny thing that to me, I've been in Africa s- several times. Well, once, twice, three, three or four times, right? And it is a place like no other, whether you're in North Africa, so you're up in the bazaars in like Cairo or something, yeah. or, in, or Morocco, uh, or whether you're down in South Africa, seeing the mine work, the, the mine workings, which was just a, a part of my childhood, seeing all this stuff on the news, um, or Mozambique, where I went which is just indescribable. I mean, I, we rocked up in Mozambique to do, um, I was teaching in a street kid school. And after we finally got off a plane, I can't remember how it worked because we landed in South Africa. Then I think we got a bus to Mozambique, but then we got on a plane in, in like Maputo and then flew to the Nampula province where we were going to work. But then we had to get on a chicken bus and within no time at all, you're out in the sticks and it's mud huts, right? Yeah. It's mud huts. And that might sound like, well, so what, Chris? Well, what I mean is it's like the Tarzan movies we watched as a kid. It's just mud huts. There's no, you know, skyscrapers there's no infrastructure there's no le- electricity in a lot of these places it's just people with pots on their head wandering you know to go and get their water in the morning and then come back and they mash their their, their this like porridge called chima yeah um and it was just ah you can see i'm struggling for work Are you, it's in it just indescribable to have such a contrasting experience to your own, and was was that how it was in 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 Kenya? Yeah, um, I'm very fortunate enough. Uh, I've done a sunshine tour with the Parachute Regiment in Kenya, um, but then when I came out of the British Army, I was I was honoured enough to be able to travel extensively and work in Africa. So I worked in um, South Africa, some. some so Somalia, Zim, um, Seven, Beyond, Nigeria. So I totally get where you're coming from. Very difficult to put those kind of what you see into words. The way I, I looked at it, it was humbling. 
Um, in the West, we take it for granted to be able to go into a supermarket and buy fresh food whenever we want. We come home, we turn on something as simple as a tap and we've got clean drinking water. I remember a time when, when I come back from Somalia, I just went into my kitchen and turned on the tap and I just stared at it because it was like we take so much for granted. But I think if people travel, and I would recommend everyone, if they get the opportunity to travel at least once in their lifetime to, uh, to Africa, um, it, it's humbling to see how people live over there. And it's a great life experience as well. Oh, absolutely. Our, you talk about water. All of our water we had to filter. And you didn't do it in any kind of modern shit. You had this big earthenware jar that you could buy. You bought in the markets around like Mozambique, right? And you filled the top half of it with water from the... We had mains where we were, which wasn't like... That wasn't usual, right? And most of the people use wells or, or, or um, like stand pipes and this kind of stuff. I think we had taps and you filled this big jar up and then you had to wait for it to drip through the clay. Yeah, you get and water. Then, and then the water tasted foul. It, it, nothing like the beautiful tasting water that we, <laughs> we have here in Devon. Yeah. But you couldn't buy anything to flavour it. The only cordial you could buy in, uh, there was one supermarket in um, uh, where I was. What, what was the name of the place I was again? Um, Muzwani, I think it was called. There was one supermarket in the nearby town. So it was about five, five or six miles away. And you could buy this cordial. It was like, I can't even remember what it was, but it wasn't even, it wasn't like orange squash or Ribena or something. It was just this, and it just flavored the water peach flavor <laughs> or, or rose flavor or something. Um, yeah. And one time I went in that supermarket and I was looking for a bit of a treat because I think it was New Year or Christmas or something. And I picked up this joint in the freezer <laughs> and the, the, the woman in the supermarket came over and went. And what she was trying to say to me is, let let the locals eat that. They've got a much tougher constitution. It's probably like a month out of date. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we're going to keep selling it till we sell it. You, you as... Um, you don't want to eat it. <laughs> yeah. You as Westerners, you don't want to put that in your stomach. You're going to be on the toilet. If, if, if you survive, you're going to be on the to <laughs> toilet for the next month. Yeah. Um, yeah, funny in it, Africa. It's, I just rem remember watching the Tarzan films as a kid and like to actually be there is, it's just, it's surreal. Yeah, it's, it's a hell of an experience. I'm, I'm so fortunate in, in a very short space of time, I'm, I'm going to be over there again for a couple of weeks and, um, I'm actually looking forward to it. Out of all the pl all the places I've been all over the world, I do like Africa. It's the it's the the old saying, "This is Africa." And if you've seen the sunset in Africa, then people un understand it. Yeah, you see that sun setting on the red clay. Mm. It's Mother Africa. It's yeah. There's it, it just no word. No no words. Do you, do you take the malaria tablets when you're there or, or, or what do you do? Uh, it's, uh, everyone should look into that. Um, I've already got malaria anyway, so there's not much more I can actually get. <laughs> so the way I look at it is, it is what it is. Yeah. We were given this larium shit, you know, and it make yeah. it gives people mental health. It can make people suicidal and stuff, right? And I got to three days in my my work over there, and I was just not feel. I wasn't feeling like I'm in Africa. I was just feeling like flat and yeah. 
So I binned it. I didn't, I didn't take any for the next six months. And all the people that did take it got malaria really bad. <laughs> <laughs> they did that pinprick thing with me. They put my blood on a microscope and they said I had like, you could have malaria up to five star. Five star was really bad. Yeah. Um, and then you could get cerebral malaria in the brain, which was like very bad. Very bad, bad, yeah. But on the five star thing, they said I had two star malaria at one point, but I, I honestly didn't even... I didn't feel anything. Um, and then I spoke to a South African guy because obviously they they live in that part of the world. A lot of them travel into Mozambique. Um, some of them were still into like diamond mining and gemstones and all these kind of yeah. weird stuff that you read in a Wilbur Smith novel. And they yeah. were like, Chris, the whole continent, continent of Africa can't take medication every day. <laughs> you know, yeah. Not, not only would their livers and kidneys be wrecked within 10 years, but like they can't afford it. You, mm. So they used to just get the malaria and then take the, I can't remember what the, what the name of it was now, um, chloroquine, wasn't it? Paladrin and chloroquine was the, yeah. were, the, were, the, were the pills. They used to just take that as the cure sort of thing. But anyway, we digress. How... <laughs> Let's talk CIA. Um, how how did all, well you you said a little bit about how that came about? Yeah, a bit of an unusual one. That um, I actually met um, a gentleman who became a very well, quite a few gentlemen in Iraq who, who became quite influential, both in the world and in 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 my life as well. Gentleman's name was, he was just a general at the time, David Petraeus. Um, and and, and, and uh, I know David, I'm very honored to be able to call him a friend as well. And we, we met when he was in charge of 101st Airborne in Iraq. And he introduced me to some people who were working with American intelligence at the time. So I started doing a couple of things for them, uh, and it just prog progressed from there. It wasn't; it, it was a really good fit because it was pretty much identical to a lot of the work that I'd done in the past, anyway. Just basically trying to find information, and I actually really enjoyed being on the ground in the culture in the Middle East. Um, some people who know me very well said I went totally native. Um, some of them actually thought I was half Arab at one point as well. <laughs> but um, yeah, so all we did was we got a little bit, of, a little bit of information. It progressed from that point, and then we started to look at high-value targets, um, terrorists, for want of a better word. Then one of the turning points for myself was Al-Qaeda Al and the insurgency in Iraq at that point had killed um, in that year quite a few people that I actually knew. Um, one of them was a senior guy in the American military who was a good friend. So I kind of take, I took it quite personally. So at that point, I pretty much looking back, it wasn't intentional, but 24-7 for a long time, um, I just worked to hunt them, to bring the bad guys to justice, to save as many American and British lives as possible. And it just escalated. From doing a little bit of work, it literally became my entire life. For a long time. Um, everyone, everyone who knows, knows I did a lot in Afghanistan. What people don't realize was before the Middle East, I was actually helping the Americans in Africa as well. I did a lot of work in Africa and I've done a lot of work in Lebanon. I actually spent six months inside his pillar in Lebanon, which was the precursor to what happened in Afghanistan. 
So what me infiltrating and being inside the terrorist network for three years, it didn't just happen. It was a lot of a lot a lot of work to get to that point. Um, and I just done one small thing in Lebanon. And the objective in Lebanon was to infiltrate Hezbollah and to stop the planned attack on off-duty British and American troops in Cyprus. That attack was, was completely stopped. And the safe houses, the entire chain of the bad guys infrastructure was taken down. So if I was, I was concerned, job done, that was the end of it. Not never gonna do it again. Um, Cause that took a lot out of me that. But then Iraq happened and Afghanistan, and it was just in the natural progression. But with me being with inside Hezbollah, that gave me the credentials for the bad guys when they checked that I'd already had other bad guys who would who would vouch for me. So that was why I was able to get in the, into the position I was in, in Afghanistan. Um, a lot of planning. It wasn't meant to be for as long as what it was. It was meant to be a three month tasking. It lasted three years. Um, and on that one, how, at one point, um, off duty members, I'll say off duty members, of the British and the American military wanted to come and get me out of prison in Afghanistan. And it was all set up, the entire Trevor Cooper, Graham Hilliard, they were the team leaders on that, on that particular task. That never happened, may I add? Because when they came, 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 came to see me, I said, stand everyone down, I'm staying where I am. That was the point when they, everyone realized that there was a little bit more to the situation in Afghanistan. We had actually been trying to find some terrorist commanders and they were in the prison I was in under false names. One of them was Salahuddin, who is now the commander and the, and the leader of the Akani network. Salahuddin's father, I also knew, and he was Ben Laden's senior mentor. A lot of this has only come out in the past six months. So that explains how we were able to stop a lot of attacks. Um, but it was like a academy for terrorism. Polish prison, 5,000 prisoners inside. Most of them are terrorists and over 50 of them were senior terrorist commanders that the West was trying to find and they were hiding in plain sight. So I made a decision to stay in there. Um, one of the other factors was the parachute regiment and the Royal Marines were in Helmand province, southern Afghanistan at the time, and the 101st Airborne were in eastern Afghanistan. And they were taking heavy casualties all the regiments were taking heavy casualties. And a lot of those attacks were organized and planned from inside Polish Shafi by a gentleman called Talib Jan. And he ran the suicide bombing network for the Akani network and Taliban in Helmand. And I spent a lot of time every day with these indiv individuals. Um, so the way I looked at it is every day inside was an attack that I helped to stop. And that meant a service man or woman could return alive to the families. I'm not daft. I knew if I was caught, I would be killed straight away. It would have just head straight off. But the risk was worth it. Um, like I said, it was only meant to be a short period of time. It lasted for nearly three years. Um, I actually ended up being 
one of Salahuddin's right hand men inside. So did whatever I had to do to get into that position. I was able to copy all their notebooks, photograph their notebooks, and copy their SIM cards as well. So, and I still have all that information, copies, or the originals in some cases. Hundreds of pages of numbers, contacts, names, bank accounts. So it went from stopping one attack, an idea attack, to actually being in a position where we could actually make a big difference here. Um, so after about a year, I kind of submitted myself to, I'm not getting, I'm not going to get out of here alive. That was a very strange mindset to be in. To walk down the corridor with 50 members of Al Qaeda was an experience. Um, and a very dark experience. You can't even put into words the mentality. One of the hardest days in there was when one morning there was a lot of shouting in the Al Qaeda corridor. Um, I just walked over, sat down, had a chai, a brew, a brew, a, 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 a brew with the senior commanders there. And they were celebrating the deaths of six British soldiers that they just managed to kill in Hamlin. Now imagine I've got to sit there emotionless, cannot show any emotion or anger because if it did it would have gave the uh, game away I was I was I, was, I would have been killed so then managed to just uh, smile shook their hands went back to my cell and literally banged me head against a wall I thought right the only way to stop this more is to go in to them I mean really into them become notorious and feared within their network. So a plan was put into, in, into place. I spoke to Walter Downs, and he was my American contact at that time. And I just asked him a very straight question. I am going to need official top cover from the American agencies if I do this, because the Brits are going to be convinced I have turned and I do not want to be charged with that. He came back the next day, said, you've got it, whatever it takes. And I went, consider it done. He then asked me a very <laughs> peculiar question at that time. Would you be willing to get the location of UBL? Osama bin Laden? I said, yes. Not if I could, would I be willing to? Because he knew that I had sat with Salah Odin every day there at that time for over a year. And I'd met his, his, his father, his brothers, every, everything. At one point, Saladin was wanting me to marry his sister. So that's how far up the chain that we managed to get. Wasn't a big deal. We located, we were the primary source, and other people have confirmed this within the NC, primary source of locating the, the, the villa in Abbottabad, Pakistan. I still have the original report that I handed over as well. I, I, I photographed it. Didn't think anything of it. That was it. Job done. Back to stopping the IED attacks in Halmand. Unbeknown to me, that little bit of information was actually about to go down in history. Um, but that, like I said, it didn't take a great deal of effort. A lot of politics were going on inside the Akani network. And I personally think that senior members of the Akani network wanted Ben Harden out of the way. A lot of other people knew where he was, he was at that time. But I think not many people had the balls politically to accept where he was. 
But like I said, the rest is history now. It's just people. Oh, my focus has gone. Hang on. Some people will say I look better like that. I look like I'm in a swimming pool or something. Um, Happy days. Sorry, folks. It's been. Uh, oh, there we go. It's been a a morning of technical issues. Amph, let's just peel back because people will be wondering how did you end up in an Afghanistan prison? What what did I miss something there? Yep, I had gave evidence against the governor of Kandahar at the time, Hasadullah. Hasadullah had been feeding the locations of British troops, in particular special forces safe houses in Kandahar. Hasadullah, the governor, had been given that to the Taliban. We stumbled across this. I gave evidence against Asadullah. In reaction to that, Asadullah put a complaint against me and had me put in prison in, in Afghanistan, which isn't a big deal. You pay the bribe and you walk out. That's the end of it. Okay. Um, but the difference was when I walked in at Al Cave, I actually spotted high value targets. So I thought, hang on a minute, what the hell is going on here? So something quite, something quite small, an incident, turned out to be something good. And I'm, all, I'm always a believer in look for the positive in the negative. Um, I think that's important. And we thought we thought, we thought we'd found one or two high value targets. Turned out we'd found a lot more. And it was a full, fully operational, Akani network, Al Qaeda cell operating outside of a British mentored jail, which was Polish Shaki. Um, so yeah. Can we just clarify what when you say a British mentor jail, are you yeah. saying this what the British have influence on that prison? It's yeah. the, like the, they scored it properly. The British embassy was the they were mentoring the Afghan jail. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, but unbeknown to them, this was before, this was back in the day, things have changed now. Um, this was back in the day before they really vetted all of their prison staff. Turns out, most of the prison guards at that time were Taliban, um, or connected, or have a family member in the Taliban. So a very, very unusual kind of set up that. Um, give an example, in Polish Aki prison, all the heavy machine guns are facing it, but inwards, not outwards. The prison guards are more scared of what's in the jail than what they are of being attacked. So that fact spoke absolute volumes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, it was basically, we just, I found myself in a very strange position thought we could do a little bit of good and that that escalated um, to the point of me and my American contacts we threw everything at this but the kitchen sink, sink on it the only downside was the British embassy was absolutely convinced I had turned because I had to make I had to make it perceived as if I had so I would shout at the embassy, at the staff when they came up. Um, I was I had a big beard. I had the I would be clothes on. I was photographed with senior members of Al Qaeda, drinking tea with them, breaking bread with them. Oh, I was yeah, I was. Uh, it was interesting at that point. Jesus, it 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 sounds like the stuff of a movie plot doesn't it or a tv series i'm thinking is it that homeland i'm thinking of yeah that thing's the vein of my life because uh, just after i'd done what i did they brought out that and i had a lot of telephone calls about that <laughs> what about amph what about the actual physical nature of being in a an afghanistan prison because we, we're talking a very, uh, let's just call it a pre-industrial country, what some yeah. people might call a shithole. 
and you're in a prison there and prison let's be honest are not known for being very nice places in the, in the western world let let alone in a underdeveloped country where i'm sure it's yeah. pretty draconian in the extreme well polishaki prison afghanistan is in the top five most violent and dangerous prisons in the world people die there every day multiple people die there every day um life inside that prison isn't worth anything um yeah pretty much imagine your worst case scenario the worst conditions imaginable with the amount of extreme violence every day times that by about six and you're halfway there so not a good environment but my attitude some people could say i'm arrogant um but i got that arrogance from being in the powers and that was if something needs to be done it gets done it was it was literally living on hell on earth but every day in there was an american and british soldier returning home to the families so my discomfort for those three years, I would do again. I wouldn't want to do it again, like, but I would do it again. Because the result was was worth everything. Um, one on a bit of a funny note while I was inside, Al Qaeda were gobbing off one afternoon that one of their members held the record for a hunger strike in Polish Shaki. I smashed it <laughs> by three days. <laughs> so, uh, but I wouldn't recommend that. I was an inch of being dead. But to to how be long did, how long? Did, how long did you do? Oh God! Uh, all in without the embassy because we didn't tell the British embassy at first about this because we knew they would go mental. Um, you, you, we're, we're on a bounce. 40 odd days for obviously with water and I dropped down to about just over eight the down as well. Mm. Um, so I was a skinny little runt. I was I was arrogant, but when I kind of saw that I was I was doing it as in trying to upset the British establishment and it was planned very well thought out and executed and the americans knew exactly what i was doing and it was all to gain credibility within the prison mm. and it worked that amongst other things put it all together it worked well i would not recommend that to anybody because my body had been through a lot at that point anyway and yeah, nearly killed us. I, I remember waking up on the floor, spread eagle with IVs in each of my arms, all, all that sort of thing, just to keep me kind of there. But the Taliban and Al Qaeda have been spouting off that they held the, the, the record for the longest hunger strike in Poly Shaggy. And I thought, you know, something I think a British should actually hold that. So, and we do end off. And on the subject of food, what what was the staple diet in the prison? Rice and bread. That's what the normal prisoners get. Um, not a lot of it. It's unhygienic. There's bits of rock in the rice. Um, yeah, it, it's not good. It changed for, for me when I became affiliated to and part of the Akani network and Al-Qaeda, then my conditions in the prison changed dramatically. Um, myself and another Westerner, I arranged that we got our own room. We became very influential within the prison. We had the keys to my cell as well, so I could come and go whenever I wanted. 
as long as I was in the sun on a locker padlock, if the Americans happened to do a spot check, our food, we got fresh food, Al-Qaeda arranged for fresh food to be brought in every day as well. So at that point, for us, it went well. Um, we ate well, but your basic person in there, and the first year I was in there, it was hell. And how did they come to trust you then? If, if you went in there by giving evidence against this guy. Yep. What, did, they not, did they not know like your background from that, that incident? Yep. Um, they knew everything. Um, the Akani Network, there, I actually knew their head in intelligence officer, their reach of getting information is phenomenal um, because I knew they were good. I'd seen it and I was upfront and honest with Salah Houdin himself personally. I stood in front of him and said, if you want to kill me, you do it yourself. You don't send you cronies. So I walked through a corridor. Even the guards thought that was a really stupid thing to do. I had a chat with him, sat him down and he respected the fact I had the, the balls to walk through his entire corridor to his cell, knock on the door and walk in, have a conversation. I said, this is, this is what I've done. This is who I am. I also, and this will astound a lot of people, I already knew that they had inklings that I had been in the military, the British military. So I told Salah Houdin that I was a former member of the parachute regiment. I thought if best he hears it from me right now, then the Taliban tell, telling him, then me being executed. I told him, he went and he pulled out a piece of paper out of his pocket from his robes he was wearing. He already had the information. He already knew. And if I hadn't have told him that day, I would have been executed. So their intel is really good. But I found honest, straight to the point. I missed out the little bit that I'd spent a lot of time with the Americans. They didn't know that. It was a calculated risk. But I knew I'd covered me ass well, and I trusted the Americans. Um, turns out the Taliban actually employed some of the interpreters in the British Embassy in Kabul. That was a source of a lot of their information. I passed that information on to the British Embassy consulate during one of their visits, including the personal mobile number of some of their interpreters. And my advice was get rid of them, feeding information back. Mm. Then I started shouting at them, telling saying I wasn't very happy. <laughs> so this network that you've infiltrated, what it, I'm, I'm just trying to clar clarify here because it, it's, gosh, it's a, quite a complex tale and it's very unusual, mate. <laughs> it's, um... The Yakani network was basically what I went into. The Yakani network is the predecessor of Al-Qaeda. Okay. It's one of the oldest terrorist networks around. And in, okay. in, their, in their minds, yeah. what, what were you doing in country? What? I was in country running a private security operation, ex-British Army. I had a fallout with Asadullah, who was the governor of Canada at the time, who was a drug dealer, and feeding information back to the bad guys. And I was disheartened with the establishment. That was the official line that went out. So 95% of what Salah Houdin and his lieutenants knew was accurate. The other 5% was that they made an assumption and they misjudged it. I'm a fifth generation soldier and I am a patriot. 
end of. Mm-hmm. Anyone who knows me knows I will bleed on our flag to keep it red. That's not a problem at all. It never has been. Even the personal bodyguards for the British and ambassador in Kabul knew me because they were all former members of the parachute regiment. And when the ambassador was telling people that I had never served in the British Army, the, his personal security detail pulled him up and said, you might want to relook at that one because we know he did. And we served with Anthony and we served with him in Northern Ireland. So interesting that that, that was. But then the ambassador had a little bit of, of, of an ass with me. Then his team leader turned around to the ambassador and said, Anthony doesn't work for British intelligence, but he's very close to David Petraeus. You might want to look at the American connections here. And they did. <laughs> but um, very difficult, the Akani network, is very difficult to put it into words, but they span the entire globe. They have members in police forces, in militaries, in governments, bank and accounting. They have members everywhere. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing, um, well, I'm not guessing. Mo- most organisations with that much power do have people around the globe, don't they? Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking of my um, experience with the Hong Kong triads. <laughs> um, and it's not that difficult to do to have affiliations now globally, is it? What with the internet? It, it, it's-, it's easy. The, I was absolutely astounded. Um, one of the things that a senior, a senior American went on record was that the Akani network does not have the capability or the infrastructure to hit targets outside of the Middle East. Um, yeah, so my reports I was I was I was handing in while I was inside Polishaki were going contrary to what some of the American government advisors were saying. I give them heads up the Akani network was connected and they were going to well this is all that's in the books now. Times Square the car bomb, direct link from that to the Akani. End of. I was in. I was in the room when they were talking about it. Then about two months afterwards, two 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 and a half months afterwards, all over the news, Times Square. Um, unbeknownst to most people, that wasn't the only one. That was the only one that was made public. It was over hits that were going to happen by the. Uh, by the Akani uh, network on the mainland America and Great Britain as well. So the Akani uh, network at that point, everyone sat up and thought, you know something, these guys are organised, motivated, financially independent, and they've got a, a long reach everywhere. So I thought, after I saw all of that, I thought this is a good organisation to infiltrate because you could see it was put together. And being from the inside out, people in the West like to give the idea that some of these organizations are not organized. I'm telling you, they are. They're ultra professional. Um, And they have a high hierarchy. So the way I look at it is, and, and how I was able to stay alive all those years, Take it for granted that your enemy knows more than you at all times. That's the only way to stay alive. The moment you think they're not organized and you all you hold the upper foot, game over. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. The, the, so some of these organizations, the triads, has, has bullet the Lebanese terrorist organization. In the past 10 years, they have become a global entity. There's no affiliations between Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, the Akani network. Some 
Pfizer's might could go against that and say, there's no evidence of that. Complete crap. I've sat in a room with senior members of Hezbollah and Al-Qaeda and the county network in the room, meeting them. Mm. So they do talk to each other. They help each other. They also share their safe houses, mun munition dumps, and this is the important one, intelligence. They share it. That is a problem. When service organizations start working together, the West have got a problem there. How do you feel then that, you know, I mean, see, I see a very different narrative in, in play in the world, and it's probably not, not what a lot of people would think, Amph, you know? Mm. I'm being very careful what I say on here as well. So well, I, 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 I think we both have to be careful what we say because of the platform, <laughs> the platform yeah. that we're on. But, I mean, you just take the CIA history of out-and-out -out corruption. Yeah. You know, clearly puppets for the what I call the sociopaths the ruling elites the drugs that they've flown around the world the 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 conflicts that they've helped support to achieve a certain aim again I just call them the sociopaths because yeah I don't think there is like nation states anymore there isn't a Britain in America and we fly this that's just for the people to buy into, right? These fuckers operate on a completely different level. Yeah. It, even you telling me about these um, high profile leaders, right? First thing comes in my mind is they probably work for the Americans, you know? Yeah, I, I can't. They work for the Americans and they're controlling the shit in Afghanistan. And I, I mean, no disrespect when I say this, I mean the opposite. I mean, until we out these fuckers, we're going to keep having these uh, conflicts. We're going to keep having this phony enemy over there that, oh, right. Um, and I'm just wondering, how do you reconcile yourself, Ant, with, 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 with this kind of, you know, th 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 this perspective, which is becoming... Um, I think more and more obvious to a lot of uh, political, global, social, interested commentators like myself, but obviously I, uh, there's, you know, the, the movement for truth now is, it's at an all-time all high in the wake of what's happened in the last 20 years. And I've, yeah. I've got to say this, mate, because otherwise it just sounds like we're playing like toy soldiers. Um, yeah, and these fuckers will just keep playing us. So, uh, over to you, mate. Sorry if I. My my opinion is um, the more I know to do with the Middle East, the less I understand. If that makes any any sense at all, mm. I've been down the rabbit hole, and that concerned a lot of people. And me being alive, surviving it, really concerned a lot of people. Because I kept logs, diaries, photographs of everything. Okay? And just to back up what was going on. So if I was killed, then my family would be given me diaries, me photographs, me Panasonic top book laptop everything so they would know that one i'm not a traitor to who i work for to why i did what i did for the greater good mm. now because i've been down the rabbit hole and i've seen how it really is in reality it's a bit daunting for want of a better word um i, I do not and i've never had a problem with the British establishment or Britain as a country, like I said, 
I'm a patriot and my oath of allegiance is to Queen and Country. And any soldier knows once you take that oath, it's for life. I'm very proud of being in the Airborne Brotherhood as well, both Britain and the United States. And I take that very seriously as well. Um, but certain people who are now not within their jobs, within the establishment, they abuse their power quite often. And I've physically seen that with my own eyes as well. Mm. They fit the narrative that they want to put out there, which will fit into the objective that they want to achieve. Um, if we wanted to stamp out terrorism, it could be done. Okay? The government at one point knew where all the bad guys were, knew where they were, the MO, the infrastructure, the networks, they could have smashed it. But because of political correctness, um, operations and groupings like Task Force Black, um, it was disbanded. Maybe now it's back under a different name. But at the time, David Cameron disbanded Task Force Black, which was obviously the black on black, the good guys going after the bad guys, doing whatever it had to take to keep our country safe. We've got very politically correct. You don't um, think, um, I'm sorry to be, Yeah. I don't wish to be confrontational, but to a lot of my viewers, David Cameron would be the bad guy. Boris Johnson certainly would be the, the enemy of the people. Um, yeah, they're not exactly the knights in shining armor at the moment, are they? Well, I'm just trying to make sense of it all, really. You know. I think it boils down to the more we know, the less we understand. I think the bigger picture, um, it's all about politics. I try not to get involved in any of that. I'm just, I'm just a soldier who was on the ground doing my little bit for Queen and Country, and that was it. I never meant to upset the British establishment. It was, that was not my objective. But I did push back when they accused me of being a tra traitor. Um, I'll speak very frankly, that really pissed me off. Um, and one of those politicians who tried to say that um, wouldn't last one day in Afghanistan. Not one day. Well, and they, they wouldn't have the minerals or the balls to do what I've done for this they country don't, either. They don't go there, mate, do they? They certainly don't send their children there. There's a, yeah. there's a, there are obviously always exceptions to the rule, but um, yeah, one rule for them or one rule for us. Well, um, can I can I just pause you a sec, mate? I'm sorry, I've I've drunk. One sec. Sorry, friends. I don't know if you gathered that, but we had a tea break. Not not to drink tea to to get rid of it. <laughs> Um, and bloody hell, what a story. Um, what, uh, sorry, what an experience, I should say. How, how did all this play out? How did you get out of prison? I was, uh, <laughs> that's actually a bit of a sensitive point. Um, I was renditioned from Afghanistan back to England. Um, because I was, uh, this is the other bit of history which I'm not happy about. I'm the only person in, or the first person in history to be extradited or renditioned from Afghanistan back to England. And I was gutted about it. Um, but the rule was if I had been compromised inside the prison and multiple sources were telling the Americans, that I was about to be executed, that was the only time I had given permission to be pulled out. Because once you're pulled out, I'm out. I can't get back in again. Um, the problem occurred, though, my situation in Afghanistan had grown a lot of attention, unbeknown to me. 
And don't forget, I'm a Westerner in prison in Afghanistan. Um, so my work and who I worked for was not known to the Brits at, at that time. And the Brits pulled me out without telling the Americans what was going on. So imagine my surprise one day when I'm shackled and like a proper terrorist and put on a transport and taken to the airport. And I'm met by Scotland Yard's extradition squad. Um, yeah, that was interesting. My first question was, where's the American RSO, Regional Security Officer, which was the CIA station chief? And they said, why would he be here? And I went, okay, can I make a phone call? So I rang the Americans and said, I've just been pulled out. Obviously, you're not aware of this. You need to look at this now. And I'm, I'm shackled, getting onto a plane. I'm about to be charged for being an international terrorist. So I said, would you mind um, helping me out with this situation, please? <laughs> did they acknowledge you or did they try and deny it? No, the, um, the Americans contacted the Brits and they said, um, well, along the lines of, apologies, we have to revisit our last statement. Anthony Malone is one of our guys. He's been working mm -hmm. with our teams for quite a considerable amount of time. Uh, up until that point, the Americans had pretty much denied everything. Um, the extradition team at that point weren't quite sure what the hell to actually do. I do know that there was a very high profile correspondence from the American government to the British government to the point of the Americans told them quite a lot of what I did, what I was involved in. And a senior member of the extradition team shook my hand and said, well done. And I said, right, well, what's going on here? They said, well, this is going to get interesting. You've got to be taken back to England. I went, why England? I'm supposed to be going somewhere else, maybe a US military base to be debriefed in full, given the fact I had a notebook on me at that time, a um, little black notebook that had all of the operations that uh, Al-Qaeda and Akani were going to conduct in the next couple of days against our troops in Afghanistan. Um, so then a senior member of MI6 met me, at, or British Intelligence met me at the airport off the tarmac straight away and said, here is the book, you need to action it. There's also the bank account details there of members of, an, uh, of a government, I want to see which one, that is being paid by the bad guys. Said so you need to close that particular leak down. And they did. Um, then it all got very strange. And I've been informed I was put in the fridge for four years in England, spent four years inside an English jail on trumped up charges just to keep me quiet. Um, I officially was interviewed by British Intelligence and Special Branch at Stoke Newington Police Station, where they were trying to get their head around how they could deal with everything. At that point, I was re recruited by the Police Special Branch and asked would I infiltrate a, basically an extremist network inside British jail because they were planning the attacks on in, in, the, in, in the United Kingdom. And me coming back from Afghanistan as a terrorist commander would hold a lot of credibility. So my answer to that was obviously, yeah, I haven't got anything else planned for the rest of my life. I'm happy to be back in England. Um, only thing they said was, you've got to keep on wearing your Arabi clothes. Because at that point, they asked, what could I get, get me something? I said, yeah, I want a pair of jeans, a shirt, a haircut, and I want to shave me beard off. And they said, you can't do any of that. You've got to keep being looking like an extremist. Um, that was when the Brits found out that al Saeed Ahmed, terrorist commander, was actually me.
So if you were elevated to terrorist commander, was that was it not a worry that you would then have to organise some terrorist shit? No, I never put myself in a pos in a pos in a position where I would ever have to organise anything or I would ever do anything which would be against the national security of the United States or Great, Great Britain. Never put myself in that position. Saladin wanted me to run his training camps in Africa. What? That was the angle on it. Yeah. So if you, when you're in prison in Afghanistan, what if they said, right, here's a knife going off that guy there? You know, obviously as a test of your allegiance or what do you know what you would have done or is that an un, unfair question apologies if it if it is no ask me any any question but i've got to be very careful how i answer certain things people are not daft i didn't just get in a, in a position i was in in there the way i look at it is they were bad guys they were killing our troops in Halman on a daily basis and i'll stand by everything i have done and everything i have said and i did what i had to do to help save british troops and american soldiers so and i became quite a notorious individual inside the jail to the point of when some of the other terrorists were late to go to the mosque I used to give them a polite conversation, is the word I would use. Maybe a little cuff on the back of the head to get them to be on time next time. So, yeah, I was arrogant. Did it, but I did what, what it had to be done to gain their trust, inflate the network. And my, my objective was, I didn't just want to smash one terrorist attack. I wanted to map out their entire network. Taking one person out in a terrorist group isn't going to achieve anything. You hit the, their, their finances, you hit the safe houses, weapons dumps, their informants, you map the whole thing out. Then you've got a chance to save a lot of lives. Mm -hmm. That point, I was privy to information on attacks outside of Afghanistan, including England. So like to answer your question is there was pretty much within reason not much that I wouldn't have done. I ended up running a kickboxing club inside Polish Chaki as well, only for the terrorists. That way it gave me kind of the legal ability to beat the cack out of them um, in a nice way obviously so uh, took out a lot of me frustration mate if there's yeah. a wave of kickboxing bloody terrorist attacks in london next week i i know who to blame <laughs> no i reckon 95 percent of all the terrorists i knew have died in drone strikes yeah, One of them died yeah. When I was on the telephone to him um I, I, i'm sorry i just want to ask you a, it's a silly thing but i get these silly questions in my head that i want to that i'm never going to get the chance to ask again um like did they did they pay you the cia we do, do you get paid for doing this or do they give you like a backhander or something the only thing i got and the only thing i would accept was to cover operational ex ex expenses that was it. I would not accept payment for the work hmm. because if I did, in my eyes, that would be unethical. That's 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 my personal view. Other people might disagree, but yes, operational expenses were covered. Fuck me, you're putting a lot of work in for these guys, mate. <laughs> I think they should have uh, given you something. It. Yeah, to to me, like I said earlier, it was a personal thing. Um, these guys had killed some of my close friends, 28 of them, to be exact. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm talking. I took it very personally. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm 
talking a bit lightheartedly, but I but I do I I didn't mean that seriously. I just wondered if they like pay you. Um, that is a valid question. The thing is, if you pay an asset or you pay a source, you never really know if they're doing it for financial gain. Yes. Yeah. The way I looked at it was from day one, week one was it was it it, it was actually offered. I was offered some payment. I said no. I said because the way I look at it is I will never pay my assets or my horses. It doesn't happen. And I've had people, senior people, come to me, offer me information. And I said, the information you give me is for free. And I might do you a favor or protect your family, but it's free. That way I know what you're going to give me is accurate. Mm -hmm. And that, that was why I became a grade A intelligence source for the Americans and the British, which is quite rare. Normally, information has got to be verified by three different sources before it's acted upon. I was one of the few occasions where anything I handed over, it was hyper accurate and they acted on it, mm. which was good. So to gain that, that amount of trust takes years. And I put myself in harm's way many times to get that. But it was good. It worked well. Job done. Life saved. All I've done now is I'm using my contacts through, throughout America, Britain, and within different organize, organizations to, to help me with my little bit of charity work that I do to help veterans. Because a lot of young soldiers have been through Iraq, Afghanistan. A lot of all the soldiers have been through Northern Ireland. And they find it very d difficult to adapt and live in civilian street. Mm -hmm. um, you, you've, you've, you've been around the, 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 the block yourself. You've, you've, you've seen it yourself. When guys have been in combat zones, hostile environments for many, many years, very difficult to adjust back to civilian street. So I'm using what I have and what I've done to do that how how was it for yourself then and did, did, did you uh, careful i will say this i was going to say did you suffer mental repercussions through what you went through because you were yeah. clearly clearly under a lot of stress for a long time anyone who says they don't suffer mentally from working in the shadows or doing any any sort of either in the combat, in the military. Um, I think people have got to be very honest about it. It's a stressful situation. Um, some guys are shot at, they are they are blown up. And yes, it does leave its scars. But you've got to take the positive out of the negative. You cannot live in the past. You've got the you won't ever forget everything you've, you've witnessed or been through, but you use it to your advantage, which comes into a positive mindset. Uh, when I come back for the first year, two years, I found it hard um, on a lot of different reasons. One of them was I was devastated I had been pulled out. Because every attack I saw, in my mindset, I thought, if I was still there, I could have stopped that. Um, and it, it, up until quite, quite recently, that has plagued me for a lot of years. But I've been, in, I've been informed by the colonel and the general, if I had stayed, I would have been killed. I went through the door of no return. So I was lucky to get out the way I did. Yeah, I can relate to that, but only obviously in my own life. When I've been focused on shit, you know, and other people get involved and, and they think they're doing their best for you, which which they are, but it it leaves you in a state of um, like 
not grieving ain't the right word, but like a bit of loss, a bit of depression, a bit like, no, I was out to do that. And yeah, it was tough, but I, I knew it was tough. And that is what I set out to do. And you've now pulled me out of it. Uh, for, yeah, it. I, I guess I'm trying to highlight uh, a, a mental thing that's probably a bit unique to us servicemen. Yeah. That, that like, yeah, we're in harm's way because we fucking choose to be and it's what, what yeah. we want to do. And you've now just fucked it all up. And I, sorry, mate, I'm being a bit random. I know. I, I'm, I'm, no, it's not. You're absolutely right. I think a lot of people who are watching this are going to understand it. They will relate to it as, 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 as well. It's like a lot of guys who go out there, I've, uh, in combat zones, either the military or even now the private sector. A lot of private contractors, military contractors, go out there and they see a lot. They have contacts every other day, um, getting firefights, they've got to put rounds down. It's a bad experience. But when the, everyone comes back to civilian street, as in you get onto an airplane now, and literally within 12 hours of pretty much any war zone in the world, you can be back home. And to walk off a plane at Heathrow Airport or walk into a supermarket and everything's calm, it's normal. A lot of, a lot of civilians won't understand. It takes a hell of a lot to try to adjust back into civilian street. Mm -hmm. um, because of my background, because of all my family has served for five gen generations, I think that really helped me because I've always been military orientated, even from a very young age. And I've known, I've spoken to people who I've known for over 30 years, and they're actually quite taken back. That I'm a little bit older, I'm a lot wiser than what I was when I was 21. And I've learned a lot about life, but I've also seen how cheap life can be all over the world. I've seen people die in front of me, and it's given me a humbled perspective on life never take it for granted and it's like when you said earlier about kenya when you see people who haven't got anything you think you know someone our lives in the west ain't that bad we have cars we have phones we have food on the table we have a roof over our head so really we're doing all right, even if I have a bad day. And I do. A lot of the lads won't ever believe that. I get days where I don't want to get out of bed. All right? I could watch something or I get a memory about Afghanistan. And it knocks me for six. Um, but I pick myself up, go for a walk. I think about it. I thought, you know something? Stop, stop hooking around. Pull yourself together. There's a lot of people out there that are a lot worse off. I came back in one piece. A lot of guys haven't. So I think some of the guys who have come back, yeah, some of them drink too, too much. They let their anger out. It happens, okay? But I think the military community in this country, especially the veteran community, should be working more to, to together for the greater good of veterans. The veteran community with some of these charities out there, it ain't about egos. It ain't about what you can take. It's about what you can give and help each other. Veterans should never try ripping down other veterans fundamentally wrong. Hey, most veterans spend all their time ripping down. <laughs> Yeah, I know, but it's. Sad. I know it's only social media, and it's probably not a realistic. But I only make the point that 
a lot of you fuckers out there spend all your time just talking shit about other people and you forget we are in a suicide epidemic you know yeah. the people you are slagging off are then going hanging themselves in their in their fucking child's bedroom right or gassing themselves in their car it it is serious right the problem the the problem amp is we all join up out of ego we're young you know yeah. we want to fucking prove ourselves we've all had shit child or a good deal of us have had shit childhoods and, and and the military offers us this thing where we can it's a proving ground you know yeah the trouble is you got at some point in your life leave that ego behind and start oh, being, start being a human being and start to operate like you haven't got the uniform on anymore you don't wear the berry you're human being stop my suggestion would be stop using that as, as the base of your whole identity is that yeah. when you were 18, i.e. like 40 years ago, you put on a uniform, stop it. Start being human. Start trying to support people. Start trying to understand that everyone's different. Start to learn empathy. Start to realize that we've all been through massive experiences, many of which are outside of the military. This, this kind of thing, because... I see it all day long, you know, I, I'm not going to use any examples, but I've got a friend, he does a massive amount for charity, right? More than most of these fuckers would ever get off their ass to do, right? And I've seen him the other day, just absolutely slated on a website by these old veterans. And sorry i can't be more specific but i'm not into like slagging people off on the bloody media right but it it, it doesn't achieve anything it's like what if that guy it. went and hung himself tonight you know you fuckers will be responsible you you're the guys up up there with your keyboard warrior you know it, it but so i'm being a bit vocal but it's because no, I think it's right. You know, I think um, I think a lot of veterans out, not all of them, some veterans out there need to take a long, hard look at them at themselves, and they need to look at the qualities of why a soldier or any serviceman is what they are. We stand stronger, united. We fall divided. And because of what's going on in this country right now and the world, okay, everyone needs a hand up. Just having a kind word for someone can make their day. Mm -hmm. Having a bad someone can destroy their day. Kindness is free. doesn't cost anything. All right? We've all got stories, backstories. We've all done things in our life. It doesn't matter. It's what we do now as a community, both civilian and veteran community. It's what we are doing right now and the next few months that are going to define us. And I'm hoping some people step up to, to the mark and, and start helping, not being negative. Be positive. There's positive you can find everywhere. If someone needs a hand, Someone needs some food put in the freezer. Go and do it. One kind deed a week. That's it. You'll feel good about yourself. But it's a lot better than ripping somebody down. I mean, that's my personal opinion anyway. I'm not going to be like um, slated for giving my opinion. But the difference about me is I give my opinion, my thoughts. I don't have an ego. I had that knocked out of me years ago, right? But the way I look at it is people should just start working as one. And I am very passionate about the veteran community and helping veterans, especially the younger ones who don't have the, the life skills before they went into combat. Christ, I've seen guys who are 22 years old three operational tours 
they they look like that they they actually look about 12. That isn't a disrespect to them. It's just that they haven't seen a lot of life and they've been thrown in in the in the in the in the in the, in the deep end. And most of the memories that they have are of a combat zone. The best way to cure it, get out, make new memories, nice memories, me memories with your kids, your families, everyone. You know what I mean? That's, that is what it's about. There you go. I've had me rant for two minutes anyway. Hey, mate, that wasn't a rant. That was just perfect common sense. And on that note, mate, I'd just like to thank you massively. I am very aware we've probably only touched on a fraction of your story and your writing career, et cetera, et cetera. But we can come back and do that um, in another episode. Um, I'd rather do it in two hits. Um, okay. This has been an absolute pleasure on yeah. your show. And I hope the veterans who, who, who watch this can enjoy it and take a little bit of positivity out of it as well. Brilliant. And I'll put all your links to save us going over them now. I'll, I'll put them all below the YouTube video. So if anyone well wants to get hold of you or read one of your four books or learn more about your story, then, then they can do that. Okay, Chris. So it's brother, been emotional. Yes. <laughs> My God. I feel like I've been... Uh, proxy dragged through a Pakistan uh, through an Afghanistan prison <laughs> so I say Pakistan that's the closest I've actually been on the Afghanistan border in Pakistan like literally I've stood there and the border is I'm on the border um, I took a wrong turn in believe it or not in the desert and nearly ended up in Afghanistan but that's the closest I've I've been to that uh, that country but so far we are all young. <laughs> Happy days. All right, Chris. Do oh, so take care of yourself. Yeah. Have a good one. Stay safe and be best regards to all the veterans out there. Nice so, one, mate. Stay on the line. To everyone at home, massive love to you. Thank you for watching another episode of Bought the T-Shirt Podcast. If you could please click the like, click a like and subscribe and the notification bell. That helps us out. Ciao.